And Sato's Place is brought to you by... Wow, one of the top 10 guitar session players is joining us at the desk. This is going to be a good one. We got a brand new ITL. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Wow, guys. All I can say is... Whew. Man, welcome. Glad you're here. It's going to be a great show. Um, I love guitars. I love guitar playing. So this is going to be a special day for us. Herbert? How are you, man? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I know. We're, I mean, we're just, we're like, we're not Whoa. even looking what the show's going on because man. it's just so good. Why don't I get through some information pretty it. quickly do and, it, uh, it, so we can it. get to the moment. Hey, guys, thanks for joining us. Great to see you again. We, of course, are coming to you live from the Art Institute of California, Los Angeles, from our HD studios, which stands for... Herb and Dave. Herb and Dave. Or, or today it might be hot damn. Hot damn. No question. Um, really quickly, thank you so much for the support on the likes and the subscribes. That empowers you to keep us coming to you. So very keep important. those things going. It's both appreciated and very, very important. Um, hello to our wonderful sponsors who make this all possible. Uh, our avid folks, we have to apologize. You got caught in the president's entourage this week, so you couldn't get to Dave's room to install Pro Tools 11, right? President Obama was recording this no, week? No, he, he actually, they went with him instead of you. Well, you know he has a Pro Tools rig in that limo. Yeah, the big absolutely. black Cadillac. There's a Pro Tools rig in the back. I know. Yeah. So we'll reload and get that done. Hey, avid. And to our Vintage King folks, as usual, what's up? I know you guys were back in Detroit powwowing. Hope all that went well. Uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, um, we've got a special show we did with the Vintage King folks um, from the legendary studio made even more famous by the Sound City documentary oh, that, that Dave so Grohl did. We were granted special access uh, with Kevin Agunas, the owner, an incredible producer and mixer and tastemaker of his own right, and along with uh, the Vintage King owners, two super cool brothers, yeah, right, yeah. Mike and Andrew who are really passionate about music, musicians, and gear. They're one of us. We're editing that now. We're going to show that to you. Uh, so that I'd say it's kind of recording at its purest, wouldn't you think? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, just let, I mean you can feel the, the, the legends that were there and, yeah. the, and yeah. the history of that place. It even smelled right. That was really cool. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Vintage King has um, that same one more week on that promotion for us. So you can get 100 bucks off of a Mog Audio EQ4 plug-in. Here's what you do. Go to vintageking.com forward slash Pensado Deals. Enter the promo code we love Mog M-A-A-G, and you are good. Really simple. That's vintageking.com forward slash Pensado Deals. Enter promo code we love Mog. Good stuff from our VK family. A question from, from Dave. Am I eligible to win? You are not. <laughs> <laughs> and before, look, guys, before we, get to, uh, before we get to this incredible guest that we have, um, if you're in New York and you're at a school or attached to a theater, could be Manhattan, could be Brooklyn, hit me on my Facebook page. Dave and I are talking about coming back east, and we think a great theater attached to a school might be good. So let me know if you're connected and come to us. Uh, we are hankering to get to the East Coast and uh, do that. Before we go, really quickly, do you have a Stump the Vintage King guy? I do, question? I do, I do. I have both of those. Guitar players love tubes. Can an FET transistors simulate tubes so that we would love them? There we go. And why? There we go. We'll get you that answer. David, why don't you introduce into the lair? Um, I was working on some, some live drum sounds, and Cole came in and offered, offered some suggestions, and I really liked what he did. So this is an into the lair on how to do cymbals, featuring my assistant, Cole Nystrom. Guys, I want you to meet Cole Nystrom, my uh, assistant. Cole brought me a mix that he had done recently on one of his clients, and I really liked the drums, I really liked the cymbals. So today what I thought is I'd pull up a, a track by Robert Mackey and uh, AVM and let Cole uh, play a little bit with the cymbals on that and kind of show you what, what his technique is for cymbals. He's a drummer, and I really liked what he did. So 
he's been engineering about a handful of months, but I think he's nailed this technique. So check it out, all right? Cole, take it over. Thanks, Dave. All right, guys, as Dave said, my name's Cole Nystrom. I'm his new assistant. I'm gonna go through how to treat uh, cymbals today. So real quickly, let's just dive right in into it. Let's just play the track as it is right now. Cool. So let me uh, show you what we started with. We're going to be focusing on cymbals. So why don't I just solo those for you guys right now? This is what we were given. Okay, so it sounded pretty good. So let's uh, dive first off into the overheads. One of the main things I was noticing is that this, uh, the crash hits really seem to stick out. So what I did uh, just to treat that section was to bring it down a little bit with a, just a simple compressor from McDSP. Uh, knocking it off, you know, say maybe about 6 dB. You know, have a, uh, have a fairly slow attack and fairly fast uh, release. So that's with the compressor, that's without it. With it again, you can kind of hear how it just evens it out a little bit. Then after that, ran it through an SSL, just uh, wanted to brighten it up a little bit. So, and also take out some of the low end, just make it a little bit more pronounced. And also one of the other things that I did is I went into the mid range, pretty much from say about one and a half K up to eight K. I took a little bit out of that room, mainly to uh, give more energy to the vocal, more room for the energy in the vocal, and also for the rest of the drums as well. Now let's look at what we did with the rooms. This is what we were given with the rooms. Sounds pretty cool, a little bit dark, but Let's uh, kind of go through the process of what we did to treat those. So first off, we went in and we took off, you know, a little bit of the top end actually to make it just seem a little bit darker and actually push farther back into the mix. And we also took out some of the mid range again, as we said earlier, give some more room to the rest of the drums and mainly the vocal. And also, you know, heavily compressed it as well too. Did a five to six to one ratio and Knocking off a good amount of dB, probably anywhere from 10 to 12 dB that we're knocking off. And then to make the room a little bit, sound a little bit bigger, we actually ran it through this SPL transient designer and cranked up the sustain a little bit to actually make it seem like the room is a little bit bigger. So let's see how the overheads and just those rooms sound just uh, as they do right now. Cool, cool. I'm really digging how, how that's going right now. So we also had this room that was pretty much mono. It was probably, you know, about just guessing 15, 20 feet from the kick. So wanted to keep that sound, but also, you know, kind of make it a little bit dirty and gritty at the same time. So this is what uh, the mic sound is it was given to us. Really cool. Like I said, it's kind of got that dark tone like the uh, the rooms did. So let's kind of dive in and see what we did with that. We used this Devil Lock from Sound Toys and used a little bit of the crush and the crunch. Pretty much we're adding distortion or third harmonics to pretty much bring out some of the, the crunchiness and the dirtiness of it. So let's see how that sounds with the Devil Lock. really hearing that that kick and that snare just how much it really brings out so also after that we ran it through and once again an SSL just took off a little bit of the low end rolled off some of the top and once again like we've been talking taking out some of the uh, the mid-range to uh, to give that room for the uh, the vocal let that really stand out also just can press this one very lightly probably about three to six dB so um, Let's hear how all three of them sound together. All 
Also on the drum bus, we added a Clarifonic um, to you know, kind of clean up the top end, make it a little bit pr more pronounced. So let's see how it sounds with the Clarifonic. Sounds nice and clean and pronounced now. I'm really liking that. So this is how the drums sound after all the treatment and everything that we just went over in the track. Cool. So just a real quick recap of what we did. We tried to make the uh, the cymbal crashes, especially the crash cymbals, not stick out as much, have them a little bit more even, more pronounced, and also trying to give a little dirtiness and something in the room mics to actually make it stand out a little bit more and give a little bit of a different tone. So why don't you guys go through this, check out some of the ideas that we went over today, and use it for your own and see how you, what you guys do with it. Let us know. Good job, Dave and Cole. And by the way, guys, if you ever want to be in a position that Cole Nystrom is, he is the epitome of the kind of guy that you want working for you, isn't he? Yeah, he has no life, uh, doesn't <laughs> care about uh, women on any level. <laughs> no, I made that up. He's a very, Ooh, he's dedicated. He's, he's going to be a good he's, one. Right? He's going to be a good one. He's very yeah. talented. And, and his mix is really sound. And he can mix, absolutely. Very, very talented guy. We're very happy to have him. So anyways, enjoy that. Um, on to something that's just got, if you guys could have been here for all the prep for the show and hearing what's been going on, I wish we had caught all that for our audience. Mm -hmm. uh, we welcome to this desk and are honored to present you, Tim Pierce, literally one of the top 10 guitar session players in the world. Yeah, Tim, happy to be here. Thank you, man. What a pleasure. Yeah, for me too. Uh, Finally a real musician. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you know what's interesting is just how the whole set changes when you have live music. I know. Playing, like, like we're like little kids about this. So uh, fire away, David. Tim, uh, not everyone knows what a session guitar player is. Um, give me an overview of what a, a session guitar player does that's unique to that, that craft. Let's say you're a singer, songwriter, producer, somebody with a song. You want to make your song sound like a record. You come to a session guitar player to get guitar parts quickly that will make the thing blossom and sound like stuff that you're hearing on the radio right now, mm. basically. Yeah. I'm not a bad guitar player, but I'm the world's worst session guitar player because I can't remember what I played because I play from feel. How important is, is memory and, 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 and that sort of thing, like, like figuring out the notes quickly? Explain to, uh, it, take us through a typical session. Okay, so you bring a song, we, do, we listen to it once, and as we're listening to it, I do a takedown. So I get all the chords, and that's just one time. And me and my buddies are all like that. We do a takedown in one take, because yeah. often people don't have a chart. They're too busy or whatever. They just yeah. don't show up with a chart. Yeah. So it's the first time we've heard the song. I've heard the song, mm -hmm. and I, I do a takedown. Mm -hmm. And then we might have one short conversation about where to begin, electric or acoustic. I like to begin in the, in the chorus, because that's the part to me that has to really open and be pay. It has to pay off, the chorus. On, on I Won't Give Up, the Jason Mraz great single that you played on, is that the process for that single? That's a whole different process, because in that, in that place, Jason plays his song for you and sings it, and we track around his live performance. When you say we, you mean the whole... The band. That okay. was live tracking, which is really wonderful, but it's not always, always the case. Right. Um, in that situation, you try not to harm his song, because it's perfect when he plays it and sings it. So you start to embellish around it, and as the day, the day goes by, Joe Ciccarelli collects all these performances, and he makes performances out of all the takes that you do, just embellishing what Jason is doing naturally. In that case, it would be a drummer, a guitar player, another guitar player. You yeah, try to get the whole thing live? Yeah, we get it live. That's and a live bass record. Player. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bass, drums, and that's, that's, guitar. That's, that's, that's less and less a component of your profession now, isn't it? It is, and that's really only because of, of the, you know, the financial reality of making a record. It, it, uh, it's being done for a lot less money these days. So yeah. a lot of my life is overdubbing uh, uh, now, which I, I find just as much joy in overdubbing because I can really focus mm -hmm. on you know, filling a track with great guitars. Mm -hmm. so. Take me through a session where you come in and just overdub. Let's say it's at my studio, which most of them are now. They bring the hard drive with the song on it. We put it up, and then I start playing parts one at a time maybe doubling, maybe pretending I'm the guy on the right side of the stage, the guy on the left side of the stage, maybe playing acoustics, 
could be five guitar parts, could be 15 guitar parts, but that's what ends up making the song sound like it should be on the radio. Mm. Uh, that's something like uh, Iris, Goo Goo Dolls. Mm -hmm. That's something what you did on one of theirs on the Iris, right? Once again, that was a, another live, uh, live situation. Oh, that wasn't it's, overdone. It, it's, it, I got a call the day before to work for Rob Cavallo, who I ended up working with for the last 15 years, a really great buddy of mine. Mm -hmm. And they had asked Dean Parks to play mandolin on that song, oh, and wow. he was too busy. Um, so I got the call, and... I showed up with a mandolin, and I also brought an electric rig, because I said to myself, I'm not going to show up with this little teeny case to a rock band session. I want to play electric guitar in this thing. So I did get to play an electric guitar solo on it, too, but I kind of forced that on him, you know? <laughs> did, uh, did you tune your mandolin like a guitar, or you tuned it in fifths <clears throat> like a mandolin? I, I tune it like a guitar, because that's the only way that I can, I can show up and get oh, it done man. right away. I know. I know. Don't tell anybody. Uh, <laughs> uh, on... Um, on, on You'll Be In My Heart from the Tarzan movie, the Phil Collins, how did that come about, your session on that? That was with Cavallo later, and uh, Phil uh, loves movies, and he was doing the, the, all the songs for Tarzan, and we all collected ourselves down, I think it was, uh, I forget which studio it was at, Conway. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing about that that was amazing for me is I couldn't believe I was sitting there looking at Phil Collins playing drums. It was like, uh, right. I just couldn't believe it. surreal moments. Yeah. Yeah. His couldn't timing was it. good. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the way he sounds. He sounds yeah. just like that. It's like, you know, you know that sound. That, that, wow. Uh, yeah. So how important is it to be able to walk into a session and just hear the song down and instantly know the chords? Like, uh, if you don't have that kind of ear, you can't do your job, can you? It's true. I mean, luckily for me, music is simpler than it used to be in some ways. Um, I kind of flourish over simple chords. I can really paint. And Trevor Horn once said to me, the best songs have two chords because then you don't have to think. Mm. And I never thought about that. You know, you can just, you can just turn your mind off. But um, it's ultra important. Really, the, you have to win people over in the first few minutes. Everybody has to feel very confident that things are going to turn out great. Mm -hmm. And you're responsible for that. That's and right. you're responsible for it for the first five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. So no matter what's happening in the room, you have to solve all the problems and keep everybody's mood really high, so it's important. What's the, what's the longest amount of time you've gone in a session without making a mistake? I'm guessing days. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> Damn. But there's a danger in that because the, the, the best musicians take chances. And if you're willing to make mistakes, you're going to come up with great ideas. Uh, so there is a danger in playing it safe and not perfect. making mistakes. But yeah. repeatability is important. In other words, if you play something, see, yeah. that, this is what used to kill me. When I'd play something and they asked me to just alter a note, I couldn't remember what I'd played yeah. because it came from a different spot. Yeah, uh, luckily my short-term memory is great. Long-term memory is terrible. So, How luckily. hard is it to, to come into a session and have to match the, a feel that, that you didn't create? That's pretty easy because pr records, w for better or worse, records are all done on the grid these days, pretty much. So yeah. that's pretty oh. easy. It used to be that, I, I mean, I spent my whole life since I moved here trying to lay back my feel. And then in the early 2000s, people started complaining hold that up, my pocket... You mean like we do in the South? <laughs> well, like we used to, that was being a good musician. Ah, one per day. That was being a good musician. In the early 2000s, that changed, mm -hmm. and I had to start bringing my feel forward mm -hmm. and be on the it grid. Did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was freaky. I would show up, and they were going, "You're playing too far behind." What? <laughs> yeah. Now, now what do you think the sea change was? Just protest. music. Oh, got yeah. it. Got it. The grid. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. That's interesting. You know what? I, I never thought about that, yeah. Tim. But things have gotten more on the beat. Yes. Mm -hmm. The, the two still stays a little bit laid back in, in, in some instances, but the four is definitely right well, on. Well, you want to be able to play with it still. Yeah. But it's, it, as compared to, you know, the 90s, mm -hmm. it's much more right. on. Unless you were an L.A. musician. We used to make fun of you guys because you guys played too precise. We always laid back. Yeah, we were drunk a, half the time. That helped. Yeah, it's always the mm -hmm. um, rap. What can not just a guitar player, but what can the average guitar player learn from your skill set as a session player? What do you think a guy at home that's a keyboard player or a drum programmer can learn from you? Well, the simplest part, the best version of the simplest part is what you want on a song. That's something that Trevor Horn said also once. Um, and you want to play for the song, and you don't want to cloud up 
the sonic spectrum with anything that has too much bottom, too much top. You want to separate two or three parts out. And you basically want to look at it like you're an arranger. It's, a, it's kind of a little orchestra. And you want to arrange parts in different places, mm -hmm. in different uh, you know, sonic spectrums, and, and make them simple. Mm -hmm. and make them in time. Simple like what you were playing with our intro, which I'm, I'm studying and trying to figure out? No, it's more s simple like, uh, you know, Coldplay or No, that wasn't Phoenix simple, my friend. You know, that it's, was pretty it's, complex. It's, it's, simple, mean, to, simple to me means what I'm hearing on the radio and, and kind of giving up this desire that we all have to kind of be you know, guitar heroes. You know, you mm -hmm. kind of have to give a lot of that up and play for the song. Right. You know, I noticed on the intro, I would have played. I would played on the low notes on the neck. You stayed on the high notes. Was that because you felt that that would cut through better and that would fit the process a little better? Uh, I was probably trying to just be a, a guitar hero. Just, you know, <laughs> uh, 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 just why contradicting not? what I just said. Absolutely. Why there not? are times when you see. That's the thing: is that what I do is really simple and basic, and then somebody that will wasn't say, "Okay, simple. you well, went modal half the time." Well, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you play all this simple stuff, and then somebody says, "Okay, now blow us away with a solo," and oh, okay, and uh, right. then you have to really drum that stuff up because unless you live that life and you're soloing all the mm -hmm. time, it can slip away a bit. Right, right. Well, I'm happy that people still want solos. Me too. I miss them. I miss solos. Uh, we had we had uh, um, a friend of mine that did the used. I like some of their solos. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm 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 a, I'm fascinated by distortion. And uh, as a guitar player, how do you use distortion? Like you don't just think, okay, distortion is it, it's encompassed in your tone and a lot yeah. of things. I, I always look for a sweet spot. If you play totally clean. Mm -hmm. It's plinky, mm -hmm. and it, it's all transient. It has no sustain. Mm -hmm. The thing you have sustain. to do, yeah, you have to find the sweet spot with distortion to where it still reads as a clean tone, but it's broken up enough to where the transient drops, and there's a kind of a sweet sustain that happens. Can you show me that? Let's see if we can do it. That's a little beyond it. Okay. That's more where it is. Wow. See, the notes aren't... The notes are, are, are warm and sustainy, and the transient is kind of disappearing. It creates its own kind of compression, as you know. Exactly. So that's the sweet spot. Uh -huh. and, and how would a keyboard player use that concept? The same way? I think so. I just think it's easier for keyboard players because a lot of their sounds come to them from you know samples and stuff. Uh -huh. With the guitar, you constantly, like I'll play some parts and go, I think I've been printing too much distortion, I better back off. I feel like these days I'm trying to play cleaner because it seems to be more modern. Mm. But oh. not so clean uh -huh. that it gets thin and flinky. You, mm -hmm. It's that sweet spot. So, so to recap, you're using the distortion as compression. Yes. You're using the distortion to lengthen the note so yes. it will decay longer. Yes. And you're using it for tone. Yes. Anything else? Well, Full out distortion is great for rock tones. You know, you, you, you know. That's a little bit different, uh -huh. but, but generally when I use distortion, uh -huh. it's just to make a clean tone sound big and warm and fat uh -huh. and sustainy. And in terms of effects, are you still a spring reverb guy or are you more digital? Interestingly, this reverb is, has become one of the few legal effects right now. Mm -hmm. I print delay a lot, but when I use delay, I try and make it so you never hear it. So that you never hear the trail, all you hear is the guitar float a little bit like, and, and get dreamy. Because uh, to me like it's... 30 it's, second note delays? In that? No more a quarter note or dotted eighth or something, oh, but okay. something that just makes the guitar float a little bit, but oh. you don't actually hear the delay trail. Because that sounds dated. It's you know one of the things I really try and do is S sing that. I, I'm, I'm not the delay trail. You're you not mean? saying you don't do da da. You do da. In other words, you play into the delay. Well, so you make it. You put it at, at a level, and you play your part in, so that you are actually disguising the delay trail. Because you don't want to okay. hear the delay go down, down, down. Okay, that's what I'm the, saying. Yeah. So you you're like I'm playing an arpeggio, and I'm constantly disguising the delay trail with you know the ar the arpeggio the that's note. constant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. But those are really the, I mean, there's not too many legal effects right now. Most of the work I do is very dry. 
Um, mm. But it's delay and spring reverb is totally legal, which I never expected. It's, mm. yeah. Yeah. I've recently fallen in love with string, uh, spring reverbs yeah. again. Yeah. Um, explain to our audience how important the sound and tone of the guitar is to what you play. It almost, like if, if someone asks you to play an ACDC AC song, but without that tone, you can't do it, can you? It's totally true. With a clean tone, you're going to play a, wholly, a totally different part. Yeah. You might play. That works mm -hmm. on a clean tone, but the ACDC part doesn't work on a clean tone. Uh, yeah. you, know, you want it. Yeah. But it's true. If you put up a guitar tone, it will drive you to play a certain part, yeah. and only a certain kind of a part. By the way, the little pedal you're playing, I don't recognize that. It's so great. Uh, these guys came up with a great logo for, for me. Uh, it's my new overdrive pedal. It's going to be released, I think, next week, so it was good timing that I was able to bring it. It's a very oh, natural, very cool. open, warm overdrive. Rocket pedals. Very Thanks cool. It. Thank you. Uh, amp simulators, are there any that you like? I, at home, have the Axe Effects, Fractal Audio Axe Effects, which is a, a rack unit that you plug into your computer. Mm -hmm. And I'm really in love with artificial guitar tones because I spend most of my time doing real tones. Mm -hmm. And it's a really refreshing palette change when I, I use a modeler or an artificial tone. Plus, what it tends to do is it tends to bring the tone right up into your face, which for us as guitar players now is a modernizing thing, you know, it, it helps us compete with all the other stuff that's in your face and that it's samples. I don't samples. recall ever having a problem competing. I got, I go on stage with 400 watts, compete with that. <laughs> but yeah. uh, I love that sentence because it shows, uh, it shows how to stay with the new yeah. because yeah. As, as you know very well, it's, it's, you get paid to sound new, not good. It's essential. It's essential. Yeah. yeah. The state of session guitar playing today. Is there a future? Is it shrinking? What's well, it, it kind of went away. Yeah. And uh, the, the particular job that I do for a living, I don't know if that's going to be available in, in the form that I do it that much anymore. Mm -hmm. I tell young musicians that they need to be good at everything. They need to compose. They need to program. Mm -hmm. They need to play guitar. They need to play keyboards. They need to do everything and look for opportunities in every venue. Every you know? space. Yeah, yeah, because the specializing on an instrument is is not as available a career as it as it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are those Dunlop purples? Yeah, I like them for lead playing because they have a point. Me so, too. Yeah. I like them because they they're not flat; they curve, and you got to play them the right direction. Yeah, that's the one I use. That and the green. Oh, good. Okay, I like we the have green. a lot in common then. Well, you know, you and I both idolize like Billy Gibbons, and so like <laughs> when you like Billy Gibbons, you'll play with a quarter sometimes. You yeah. know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, What's the state of MIDI guitar? I've wasted so much money over the years on MIDI guitars, and they're all firewood now. What's uh, the state of that? We might get a phone call or an email from somebody that says, I have the new pickup that has no delay. But I, I gave up a long time ago. I, for I a long too. time, I bought every Roland synth, and the delay was just too much. There's a friend of mine, Harvey Starr, who makes a MIDI controller that has buttons for every string and every fret, and it's an awesome instrument. So wow. I would look at that if you were... Uh, you know, wanting a, a, it's a MIDI controller basically, minute, in the shape of a guitar. So it has a button for every single note, and you press the button, and it's no delay. It's isn't really that called pretty Guitar cool. Hero? <laughs> it is, yeah, it's, except his is the <laughs> real deal. It's the real thing. <laughs> That's, a good, That's a good call. That's a good call. That's a good call. Uh, but, but the add on, the little pickup things that you just duct tape onto your guitar, you haven't found one of those I that haven't, works. but we'll, we'll no doubt get some emails. I'm sure there's well, some I mean, of them out I, there. Well, I would actually, I would actually love to try them, you know, because um, I really want one. I do too. I really, really, really want one. And people I'm, would love to, to have, for me to have keyboard sounds at my fingertips. Hmm. Um, why is it then, why is it that when you're in the studio and you're recording and you want a, the, your guitar to sound big, you use a small amp. <laughs> Isn't that the weirdest thing yeah, it ever? Is, it is weird. I think, I think it just has to do with, well, one of the reasons that I don't evaluate amps when I'm in the room with them is you get all this hype. When there's sound pressure in the room and you're playing loud, you feel it in your body. Mm -hmm. When you think about recording, the sound is going through something this big. An SM57 is the size of a quarter. Mm -hmm. And so it's a, it's a wholly different game. I mean, you're taking this sound that's glorious and big and you're putting it through something the size of a quarter. Mm -hmm. So I think with big amps, I mean, big amps can get great tones, but a lot of the sweet tones that I use 
come at a moderate volume. Mm -hmm. And it's an 18 watt amp or a 30 watt amp, and you find the sweet spot at the amp that might be six, you know, where you just get that little bit of distortion. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with the, the, just overloading the microphone and the fact that recording is nothing like live playing. Nothing. Right, right. Two separate worlds. Yeah. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're just, you know, you can only push a microphone and a micro priest so hard mm -hmm. for sweet tones. Mm -hmm. While we're on that subject, can you tell me your go-to chain for, a, for the tone that you're using now if you were going to record that? Um, I have Neve API mic pre's. Um, I have a Bill Skibby mic pre that's brand new that I love. It's mm -hmm. from a Flickinger console that oh. I guess was Sly Stone's console. Daniel Flickinger. Yeah, and so I pretty much adhere to the industry standard, which is the SM57 and the Royer, mm -hmm. through Neves or through APIs. Um, when would you choose the Neve over the API? Well, the Neve is more like mid-range fist, as is the SM57. That's how I describe it. The, I, the API has a, a snap to it, but it seems to have more body and more, uh, a bit more full range, where the Neve is, is more mid-range. I, I tend to think of the API as better for snare drums and... and and a, a percussive things. It's great for guitar too. Okay. But the, the other thing that I want to continue mentioning is the Royer, everybody blends their 57 with another microphone. The Royer is, is the first choice. You can use anything. I have a C, C800 that my friend uh, Doug McKean recommended to me. How far back me. from the? I always put my microphones totally in phase all at the same point. Oh, okay. But if you have like a large diaphragm mic or a ribbon mic that you blend with your 57, the 57 gives you the fist and then the other mic gives you all the body around it, and that's pretty much what everybody does. It's usually a Royer mm -hmm. and a 57. So, 57 and Royer, through Neves, or whatever mic pre's you can get, they're mm -hmm. good. And Clones. always in the same plane, the two yeah. mics. Yeah. And a direct chain, what would your direct chain be? For those of you that aren't guitar players, that, that would be not going through an amp, but going straight into your DAW or board. Yeah. Direct guitar, you need to have an EQ on it to be able to brighten it, I've found. And what I do these days is, Rivera makes this beautiful purple box. I think it's called the Rock Crusher. And it looks great, and it has an EQ on it. And so I take, I slave the amp out through that thing. And I go direct into a Neve, and then I don't have to EQ it because the EQ is on the, it's got so, a So you're running, you're running an amp sound and a direct yeah. sound, and yeah. the direct sound you can go through a plug-in later or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, when I was on your website, which I'm there quite a bit, you've got some great instru instruction material. Yeah. You're an excellent teacher. Sure Thank does. you for that. I noticed you have a, dis a distressor in your rig. Yeah. Um, uh, Dave Durr is one of my favorites. Uh, uh, is that a part of your chain normally? It is. Uh, that I'm I'm an ignoramus when it comes to compressors, and that thing. Aren't I, we all? Yeah. It's no. Everybody. You, I'm sure you're if you're not. Um, but that thing is a foolproof way for me to, to fatten an acoustic sound and just limit it a little bit, uh -huh. and sometimes fatten electric sounds. Electric sounds compress themselves, and generally I'll leave it off for electric sounds, but I can just stay out of trouble with that thing, and it has, you know, you just bypass it. It's, it's really the best, it's great. What mic do you prefer on your acoustics? I, I got a, uh, I have a um, C12A from 1965 oh, wow. that I was fortunate enough to get that seems to be great. I'd like to get a Sheps. I need a, small, a good small diaphragm mic. Hmm. On your duties on American Idol, it, it's so funny. I, I hear uh, my wife watches it. Of course, I would never watch it. Oh no, I like I like I like Larry. So um, I hear a riff, and I'm like, oh man, that is so cool. And I look over there, and it's you. <laughs> yeah, we made a lot of mini records for the people on American Idol. And last season, I did it for X Factor too for John Shanks. He hired me to, to play guitar on songs. Mm. We make the mini records that they put out, you know, wow. for those shows. So you know Ray Chu? I do. Gosh, Absolutely. he's great. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. he's really great. Let me, ask, let me ask a sort of a current question, because you're working on the Al Pacino movie, yeah. correct? Yeah. And you're doing, let's take one of your current projects, like Rascal Flatts. So yeah. the difference between a film project and what's required of you and something current, is there some spatial difference in there? Yeah, for me, because I'm not much of a reader, I do, I do songs for films. You know, they get George Deering to, to do, you know, the score stuff a lot of the time. But he's actually on this film with me t tonight. We're working on it. W the film was really fun because Al came down and sang, um, and he's a fearless actor. He's mm -hmm. just, you know, he's a, he's a real inspiration. He's fearless. Um, and we recorded the song, and then 
C.J. Vance, who's playing keyboard, said we should be the band in the movie, and they went for it. Ah. So now we're extras in the movie. Oh, um, well, so look at you. very it's, cool! You know, a little bit of acting, a little bit of remembering how to sing. You know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's but it's 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 easy. We're going to be at the Greek Theater all night, just uh, oh, doing uh, very cool, you know, doing a shoot. Uh, cool. Rascal Flats. I worked with those guys three years ago with Dan Huff. They're awesome people. Oh, yeah. I got to do, yeah, yeah, I got, got to do it again uh, this summer with Howard Benson, and sure. uh, I got to play banjo and mandolin and. Joe Don's an amazing guitar player. It's great to share the, 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 the guitar duties with him. They're just great people. Oh, cool. Yeah. Very, very, very cool. On my, on my rather limited, feeble attempts to play sessions, I used to cringe when a guitar player would show me a part because they can, they can cram their little stubby fingers into such small spaces. And, and you know us, we, yeah. can't, we can't play more than two notes, uh, more than one note on a string. Yeah. What, what's, your, what's your opinion about... Uh, keyboard players at a session? I've always loved keyboard. In fact, when I moved here, I was more enamored with the keyboard player producers than anybody. Like, it, it, I couldn't wait to work with Patrick Leonard or David Foster or, like, these days it's Simon Franklin. Because um, these guys, to me, are the geniuses. And the thing for me, when I'm working with one of these guys, I, I breathe a sigh of relief because if I show up and I get into a spot where I don't know what to do, they'll tell me. Right. Try this, try that, right. try this. And it's so, it's, they're just geniuses. I love them. So what you're telling is you're deferring to a damn keyboard player? Yeah, I don't they tell don't, anybody. They don't have to play in tune. They don't have to worry about tone. They, all they got to do is just play some little keys. No, it's, it's uh, you I'm know. I'm teasing. It's, I, love, yeah. I love keyboards. In yes. fact, um, I'm actually hipping up my skills now. There's something so, fun about keyboards. Sorry, Herb. Uh, that's okay. Everything's fine. So why don't you uh, grab your batter's box questions, and we got a special batter's box. We've got a special batter's box. We're going to try and uh, stump the legend, <laughs> and uh, I'm going to name a genre, and he's going to play an example for us. Okay. We Great. haven't rehearsed this. So, jazz. Okay, here's my jazz. <laughs> yeah. I'm not much of a jazz player. That's okay. cheating. You slid that ninth in. That's the most <laughs> mundane jazz chord ever. Blues. Okay. Son of a bitch. I got to applaud for that. No question. Rock. Rock. Okay, that's just... Okay, Jimi Hendrix. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm gonna bring now. back. I'm gonna bring you back down to earth. Okay, okay, big boy. Folk music. Okay. Uh. <laughs> oh, it's too distorted. Ah. Uh -huh. I want to hold you. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! There goes our advertisers. Okay, Santana, my favorite. Okay. With the all, guitar. I was, I'm surprised. My all-time favorite guitar player. Can you play me one Dwayne Allman lick? Oh, let's see. Oh, I can't. I can't remember. States for how does States for Blues go? Uh, dar -dar 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 -dar. Yeah. Yeah. I used to know all that stuff. Fillmore East was my favorite record. So nice. Jimmy. Okay, so. He loved those, those double note bends. Country. Country used to be, you know. And now it's classic rock. Now they've inherited classic rock, so the country might be. Or wow. ACDC. Slide guitar. Oh, here's one right here, okay. Like heard them, heard them, make them cry. That's good, Herb. <laughs> I mean, Dwayne, if Dwayne would be smiling. Is that a Dunlop slide? Yeah, I, no, I think it's a Planet Waves, but. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, okay. Show me an example of an open tuning. Oh, let's see here. Uh, 
Actually, Dad Gad would be good. Let me get there really quickly. Okay. That's an open D to, to the non-initiated. Yeah. So they can do chords like. Well, you can just do one finger chords. Dad Gad's a good open D. Wow. You know what? Yeah. I think we're going to have the first Pensada's play standing ovation. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love what you did. When I think of you, I think of uh, black and white, black or white. Oh, black Michael or white, Jackson. yeah, right, yeah. Michael Jackson. Uh, can you take me through a couple of uh, parts of the process for recording that? I did a record uh, called Toy Matinee with Patrick Leonard, and he hired Bill Bertrell to produce it. This was quite a while ago. We won't say how long ago. But, uh, and, and Bill then, right after that, was producing Black or White, and he called me in to come and play on it, and Bill had played the signature lick, which I got some credit for it, but it wasn't mine. That's Bill Patrell. So, uh, but Bill said, you know, Michael is in love with this Motley Crue song. It's called Dr. Love. Yeah, absolutely. And he, he wants the bridge to be a fantasy trip through Dr. Love, Motley Crue land. No so joke. we, I, I did all this, this really heavy metal. I came up with this riff and we did all this stuff in the bridge that you'll hear. Um, and Michael was really sweet and really nice. It was, it was a really intimate situation. And Bill actually is the rapper on that song too. It's no yeah, joke. He's, yeah. Uh, he wanted to replace it, but Michael wouldn't let him. So it was, it was nice to play on that song. And I ended up getting, Credit for being on the song. Uh, Slash did too because he was associated with the video that was on the song, so we uh, already shared credit. Uh. So, what was the chain that you used for that main guitar part that you played? What? what? Uh, I think that was a Bogner. It was a Bogner Ecstasy. I wow. think that I was using at the time, hmm. and probably a Les Paul. Yeah. What what gauge strings do you usually play? Um, I usually it depends on the part. I use tens most of the time. Um, sometimes elevens or twelves. Sometimes nines, if, if I want to do like a lead and it's really spongy. Sometimes for leads, I'll tune down so the strings are a little more slinky. Mm -hmm. But the, the short answer is tens. On that song, did Michael personally suggest parts to you, or was it mostly the producer at that point? No, I, I think that was mostly me. Because it, it's funny, some of these situations that are the very best situations are the most wide open. Mm -hmm. And you're allowed to actually do whatever you want, because they're going to take their time and put it together later however they want. Mm -hmm. In that situation, it was almost total freedom. Is that more fun for you, that you can just, or is it I is like it both. I like collaboration. I like being in the room with talented people who give me ideas. I give them ideas. Yeah. I, like, I like a concept constant circle of ideas. Yeah. So did you I, just I, point at me when you said talent? I think you did. Of course did. I did. Okay. Yeah. Just General direction. <laughs> I'm getting a lot from you right now. General direction. <laughs> There's a Monty Python quote that has general direction in it <laughs> for you Monty Python people. I, I, I'm curious about this. I haven't asked anybody this question before. A lot of times I'll tune my guitar, another guitar player will pick it up, retune it, and we both sound in tune. How is that possible? Well, the guitar is never really in tune. It's all trickery. So everybody's constantly finding a way through, finding a way to make their hands sound in tune. And you mm -hmm. kind of have to change with where you are on the position of the guitar. And there are people who make tuning systems that help solve that. But mm -hmm. you're constantly kind of bending your ear and using trickery to sound in tune. Some players, their hands just play more in tune. Mine. You know, Michael Landau is perfectly in tune all the time. There's a young guy named Blake Mills, and one of the things that sounds to me about him is He's, whenever I hear him play, he's totally in tune. And I know he's not even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. So some of it is gift and some of it is hard work. Um, but the guitar is never totally in tune. It's tempered and you're always using mm -hmm. trickery. Plus, wow. if you, if you, um, the harder you press on the frets, the more sharp you get. And, uh, That's even, true. Even, you want to, yeah. Even a lot of times when we play, we'll push on the neck. It goes flat. Yeah. And then I hate playing outdoors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you ever play much live? Concerts. Um, for me, because I do sessions every day and I've able, been able to sustain this career, I, every single day I'm doing a session for somebody, and it, often on weekends too, I am challenged up to my eyeballs, the way I like to put it, right. doing sessions. So I'm not the guy who craves playing in a club because my nightclub is happening every day in mm -hmm. the studio, right. and I, I, I use a break. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. When, when you're, when you're in the middle of a session and, and you walk in and, and you're learning the song, what, what are, you, are you composing your part while you're learning the song or how do you approach getting ideas? Do you, you draw from things you memorize off records? Do you try to go with 
improvise new stuff? Impro improvisation in your world is not a good thing, is it? Well, everything I do, I, I am improvising guitar parts almost 100% of the time. But what I usually do when somebody brings me a song is I try and solve the chorus first if it's an overdub situation. Mm -hmm. If it's a live situation, then we're doing a st stream of consciousness and it's one guitar player through the whole song. Mm -hmm. But if I'm overdubbing, I try and solve the chorus first. And you're literally drawing from all the music you're hearing at the time, all the music you've heard in the last four decades, you're trying to discover the prejudices and tastes of the people who are in the room, which might be the opposite of the people the day before. So you're, you're f using a lot of different little messages to try and discover parts and sounds. Mm. Of all the well-known genres, I'm not talking about polka, polka, <laughs> polka <laughs> or something. Of, polka. of all the well-known <laughs> genres uh, besides polka, which one's the hardest for you to play on a session? Uh, for me, probably finger picking. It's my weakest suit. So if somebody asks me to do James Taylor, I start sweating and then I do a very simple uh, version of James Taylor. Because uh. for some reason, that takes, you know, I'm getting better yeah. at it, but it's, it, that's been my, my hardest. Can challenge. you do like a lot of the country guys where you pick and then you augment with these fingers? A little bit. Let me hear it. A little bit. I mean, more of the rock kind of thing where it's, you know. Yeah. And of course you get an amazing tone when you use your finger. Can you Travis? No. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, I want to embarrass you. One of the things that, um, that happens to me when I try to play sessions, and I'm horrible at playing sessions, is I just can't remember what I did when it went down. It, is there any hope for me in being a session player at this point in my life? Well, if you did it as often as I do, you would get better at it. My short-term short, short -term rem memory is really good. Long-term, not so good. So. Have you ever played that little game, Simon? You know, the dun, 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 the four, you know what I'm talking about, her? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how many notes can you go on Simon? Uh, I, I don't know, remember, maybe. I've got one backstage, so this, I'm gonna check you on Seven or eight, maybe, something like uh, that. Uh, yeah. I'm, I, would, I would guess you could probably go 30 or 40, because you've got a great memory. Maybe so, maybe so. How has, um, how has technology, there's technology that affects the gear side, and so on and so That's forth. That's a great question. And then there's also sort of technology and how it affects the business. How has technology affected the gear side, and also has it affected just the session player business overall? Well, it's been, <laughs> It's been a benefit to everybody making music, and I, I love Pro Tools. I love recording on Pro Tools. I love punching in myself. I love having people punch in. I love, the technology is amazing, but as we all know, it has made music more of a commodity, yep. and music it doesn't pay what it used to, and that's, that's the biggest challenge for all of us. Budgets are smaller, and um, we've all adapted, yep. and we're all smiling. We're yep. all you know, doing the best we can. Right. But it has made it harder, I think, for young people to do some of the traditional jobs. My job may not exist anymore right. Right? You know, at the level I do it, which is busy, being busy all the time. Right, right, absolutely. If I were to ask you to play four notes from every decade, could you do it? And, and represent the decade with four, five, six, ten notes? Well, I mean, you know. That's one yeah. decade. Maybe the 70s is, uh, uh, you know, the Stones. Yep. You know, uh, maybe the 80s is, you know, it's getting faster. Uh, yeah. Yeah, faster, right? Yeah. Yeah. Where are we with the 90s? We're like, We're open. And we went emo in the 90s. That's em I feel emo when you Yeah, do that. 2000s would be more of the Coldplay. But it'd be cleaner than that. Or the single note, you know. Uh, and then now Daft Punk has made funk guitar legal again with Nile Rodgers. Absolutely. So maybe we can do. You know, black folks are cheering all over the world. Including just me. Just <laughs> That's and black man. inside. So. That's right, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Who, who are some influences that uh, that you think would be relevant to today's young musician coming along in terms of studying music and, and, and the music we love and how to put that together and well, har harmonic the, content that the, sort of the thing. The young people I know have it better than we did because, and they do this. They start at the 60s, they go through every decade. So in the 60s, all the Motown stuff. In the 70s, Led Zeppelin, Jimi Hendrix, The Who. 
you go into the 80s, Tears for Fears, Peter Gabriel, all these people. You go into the 90s, we get into U2 and, uh, you know, Nirvana and all these people. The 2000s, let's think, I would, you know, it would be Coldplay, it would be the, the band Phoenix, uh, um, Muse. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's these days you take you're taking five or six decades mm -hmm. of music and using that as your encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. And, and you, know? Know you know what's fascinating about that is that when you look at the list that you're part of of the top ten guys, it covers that span of time. Interesting. Yeah. You know, Lukather, yeah. yeah. Proper, yeah. Jimmy Page. Right. You know, yeah. I mean, just guys I don't. Well, Nile Rodgers, obviously Brent Mason, yourself. That's a whole span of things that have that have stood the test of time. That. That tells you about the art form. I mean, that's a, that's yeah. a serious level art form. Just an aside for the guitar players, you keyboard players can take a little break. Um, <laughs> you and I both love to solo, but you and I both know it's much harder to play a solid rhythm part than a solo. It's just so hard to play the Nile Rodgers thing. People yeah. don't understand how difficult that really is. It sounds simple, but the timing part is a monster. Well, feel is everything. and. In my lifetime, I'll get pretty good at playing R&B guitar, mm -hmm. but I will not equal the people who really do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's okay. I'll still do great. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It's the, the subtle differences in feel that players have from living their lifetimes playing the way they play mm -hmm. is, is everything in studio work. And the problem is most guitar players get obsessed with the glory of playing leads or technique or playing as fast as they can. Mm -hmm. But the game is elsewhere. I often tell musicians it's like the difference between golf and football. It's, that's, it's that different. <laughs> yeah. It's two entirely different things. Yeah. Does your life experience inform your guitar player? I think it does. Yeah, yeah. I think so I too. I think it really does. I think, I think yeah. so. um, I'm, I'm obsessed with feel, particularly in mixes. What, what do you perceive as the difference that can be articulated easily between feel and timing? Is, is feel a random movement around perfect timing? Is feel usually laying stuff back? And does feel change fad-like over time? Feel, it's personal and it's your way of just putting your signature on things. But it's also the ability to play with time as you're staying in time, there you, go. you know, to, to be able to stretch and pull. Some of the best drummers rush a little bit when they fill because it's exciting. Mm -hmm. And then they come back. Especially choruses. Yeah. So, so, so feel is a manipulation of perfection. Absolutely. And yes. would, would feel, could feel be, be, be described somewhat as little tiny warts and mistakes that sound good? With the guitar, yes. More than any other instrument, people want to hear surprises when you play guitar. Yeah. And the guitar doesn't have to be perfect. Everybody lives in such a state of perfection these days that guitar actually is one of the few instruments that can actually float and stretch and surprise you with mistakes can actually work. Mm -hmm. You and I have listened to so many guitar players, we can kind of tell a guitar player not by the notes but by the feel sometimes, um, particularly the Muscle Shoals crowd yeah. and then the, yeah. the West Coast crowd, the Northeast crowd. They all We all have different feels and yeah. uh, I'm fascinated with that because there's not a lot of things that we can use to amplify and manipulate the feeling and emotion of a song, the vibe and all that, but, but the feel of the rhythmic component is so vital. Just like you said, getting happy and rushing the chorus, that just makes the chorus feel so vibrant. Um, who's your favorite guitar player? Uh, I have a lot of favorites. Um, when I started, it was Hendrix, B.B. King, Billy, Kig Billy Gibbons. Um, mm -hmm. These days, a lot of the guys in bands that I listen to, you know, for a while it was Daniel Lanois. It mm -hmm. was, uh, you know, I love the way Stephen Stills played guitar, uh, Bill Frizzell. I tend to like the guys who, who play emotionally and simply. And that's often not the guitar stars necessarily, but more the people that you hear playing on songs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very, very fascinating. That's an interesting group of people you it just is. Yeah, yeah, I didn't do that on purpose. I mean, uh, yeah. I like everybody, but, I, you know, it's, for me, you know, the guitar players that, that like Steve Cropper or David T. Walker or, you know, the, the, the guys who actually played these amazing rhythm, rhythm parts. Yeah. A sad thing, I, uh, today 
I left uh, my studio and uh, my friend Lisa was playing a George Duke record that's about to come right. out. Yeah. And he played, he fooled me. That's the first time for more than two bars I thought it was a, a real guitar. And he was playing a synthesized part, right Cole? It was incredible what he did with the synthesizer on that. So just a little moment to, to say it. We lost another good one. Yeah, and, he was amazing. Uh, and we miss you, George, already. Um, when you hear a keyboard player try to emulate a guitar, what's the main thing they do wrong that can't emulate it? Well, they're not really able to emulate a guitar because there's so much complexity and idiosyncrasy. Can I, can I do one thing? Yes. Do a bend, do, do, do a whole tone. <laughs> You can't, you can't do that. The, the pitch bend wheel just won't do that. Well, it'll do it, but there's, there's about 80 different things going on. It's the way you strike the string, how mm -hmm. much distortion is being, being hit over there. Every time you do it, it's different. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the thing. There's just so much complexity in every aspect of the guitar. Luckily, they haven't been able to allow you to press a button on a keyboard and, and imitate it. Mm -hmm. They get closer all the time, you know. But. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the subtlety on the guitar, and it, it tends to be, for, from my observations, the main differences in, in guitar players is the right hand, which seems to be the underrated hand. We all want the left hand to be the monster, but, but the articulation and the art is truly in the right hand. And, and, and uh, you're as good as any I've ever seen. Seeing you this close has been fun, seeing how... Well, uh, I, there's, there's literally an infinite number of possibilities with what you can do in the right hand. Yeah, and I've always played a little too hard with the right hand, which has turned into an asset now because I can actually just call upon it when I need. I really like to hit the guitar hard. But, but the really great, the, it's, it's much better to play light, you know. Really light, but it's also, for that me... That sound very good. Yeah, <laughs> I, get, I get a lot of emotion from <laughs> hitting the guitar hard. Yeah. yeah. I, I like Don't to try and sound like a teenager, so, but uh, so so it's good to be able to do a wide range of you know. Um, I got a little surprise for you. I was going to say, do you have? A, yeah. Why don't you show it to the camera? And uh, so there you go. A friend of mine made these. We have a a pensado pick. Well, thank you. You have to give them all to her. Now, it's nice. It's now really if you, uh, if heavy. You, if it's you heavy. use it right now, it breaks in half. <laughs> Ooh, sounds better all right tone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice, great. Nice, yeah. You know so what? Bad. I hate Confidence. to say it, but I forgot who gave me those, and it was a close friend. Oh, my gosh. That's okay. That's we'll, we'll post that. Here's a question for you. Yeah. Um, we do lots of things inside the show, which we're so honored that you joined us. And then we do some things that are not at the show. We do some live stuff. We teach things. We go places. We just had an event a couple of weeks ago where I think a thousand people registered from 14 countries. If, would you ever join us and, and be able to teach and show what you do at one of these events? If we, could of we course have I would, yeah. We, that would just of course I would. absolutely rock. Be honored. I'll be right in the front row. Oh, yeah. me too. I won't, be able to, I won't be able to moderate. It'll be like her. Yeah. Be like, bring your ukulele. I'll bring my ukulele. I can play that. <laughs> Tim, listen, thank you so much for coming. It was yeah. short notice. Um, you adjusted for us incredibly. Likewise. Uh, these kinds of things are so special. We haven't done one for about a year, right, since we did Wizard. Correct. Uh, right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to be on you, my man, because we live in the same neighborhood. All right. Right? And okay. uh, this, this has just been incredible. Thank you. Um, let's be, uh, do us a favor. Maybe, Dave, as you wrap up, uh, play us out. Let, listen, guys, for those guys back in New York, attached to a theater or a school, hit my Facebook page. Like I said, Dave and I have a hankering to come back east to do something. If you'd play us out and Dave, you'd wrap us up, what, okay. a, great, what a great show. Let's do it. Everything, everything you've learned today is applicable to both guitar, keyboards, any instruments. And um, one musician on one instrument, you can learn a lot from that person. Uh, a lot of the great guitar players, including Dwayne, Dwayne Allman, studied horn players. So if you're a keyboard player, study what this cat does. He does it as good as anyone. It's all about the music in the end, and we'll see you soon. Rock it out, Tim. Rock it out.